Okay, so um, I, I, I found the equation we were looking for, and what it is, and we'll, and we'll do we'll do the same dimensional analysis on that to make sure it's correct. So let's let's um, let's go back here to the site. So what we're looking at is Q equals V rho C sub P delta T. So heat flux is exactly what we're looking for. Um, you can see that it's in units of watts per square meter, which is kind of nice. But in the case of our system, uh, we're going to need to know the square meters of, well, of, of what? Well, no. In this, in this case, it, of the tubing. That, that's it right there. That, that's going to be, um, so on this side is your P in. This side is your P out. So, P out is going to equal Q that we just looked at times the area, and I'm going to put a T for tubing down here. And on this side, it's going to be A sub C for collector. So, we found our thermal fluid power per unit area, that's Q. We're going to multiply by our cross-sectional area, that's A sub T. That's our P out. And when we divide those two numbers by each other, we're going to get our efficiency. Is that clear enough for now? OK, good. OK, so let's go back to that site. Uh, Q equals V, V rho C sub P delta T. Now, we know that velocity is uh, length per time, right? So we're just going to go right through our unit analysis, length per time, density, mass per volume, length cubed, C sub P. We know that is energy per mass per Kelvin. So I'll write it up, I'll write it out like that. So I'm going to go, so first I'll write energy. And this is why I didn't have this guy memorized. So I'm going to first write energy, and that's So, for, so first of all, energy is mass, length squared, over time squared. So that's joules, that's the joules part, divided by kilograms, so that's the mass part, divided by temperature, and I'm going to write temperature in dimensions, rather than using T again, that's for time, I'm going to use theta for, for temperature. So there we go, I'm going to put that right down there in the basement. Now, and sorry, I used theta twice. I used theta once for angle. I used it again for temperature, but just use a different symbol in your notes if you want. That's just, that's just convention. So, and finally, this delta T is temperature. So let's go through and do our cancellation. So the two thetas cancel. These two masses cancel. I've got, um, I've got mass survives. I've got um, length. Well, I've got three. I've got three times the denominator. That's that's great. And then my uh, lengths disappear. So that equals uh, mass per time cubed. Right. So Q equals V rho C sub P delta T. The dimensions of velocity are length per time. The dimensions of density are mass per unit volume, or mass length cubed. These are the dimensions of the specific heat. So again, uh, mass times length squared over time squared, that's energy. And then this other mass, this other temperature come along for the ride. And I'm just going right back here. See that C sub P is heat capacity joules per Kelvin kilogram. And then finally, I multiply that by my delta T. That has dimensions of temperature. We don't have to go down that rabbit hole right now. I just wrote it as a theta. Those two cancel. So now we know that Q, the dimensions of Q are mass per time cubed. What are we missing to get the power? What do we need to, what, meters squared, right. So if we just go ahead and, and multiply that by um, area, and I'm, I'm going to erase this little m dot for now. 
and I'm just going to write it as um, I'm going to write it as area times Q. So you can so buried in this Q is that V for velocity, right? So there's your through variable, and um, as before, as I, as I mentioned, these are basically your across variables, and these are your through variables. And that's going to be the case in any power system. You're always going to multiply an across variable by a through variable. In the case of the thermal fluid system, A is going to be your across, Q is going to be your through. Got it? Clear? Good? Yes, sir. Yep. And then that's a solar constant. It is not the solar constant. That, that is a symbol that I use to represent temperature. Temperature changes. Yep. The temperature changes. Yep. So they cross out, you pull those over, somehow you get mass on top, and then time, which is a Q on the bottom. Oh, you know what? I, um, yeah, the, so here we go. Good, good question. So this, this length right here times this length squared becomes length cubed. And here's another length cubed in the, in the basement here. So bam, bam, bam. There you go. So, yeah, thanks. So the only thing that survives is that mass and that time multiplied by that time squared. And there's your uh, mass over time cubed, <coughs> right? And so this is this is critical step in any engineering situation. You know, it's like, gosh, I can't remember the formula. And I, I couldn't remember the thing off the top of my head, but there it is. Q equals V rho C sub P delta T. Um, and, and, I, and we knew that we went, looked at it. Well, gosh, that's in units of watts per meter squared. What's the one thing that's missing? Well, it's just the cross-sectional area. In the case of the solar air thermal, what's your, what's your, um, what's your cross-sectional area? Of your, uh, of your, uh, of your input and output, because that's where you're kind of, that's the, um, you know, kind of getting back to this. Your 25 square inches. Yeah, so you'll you'll take that 25 square inches, convert that to square meters, and then so that way when you're when you're doing your efficiency equations, you have watts divided by watts, and you'll you'll come up with a number, a dimensionless number, which efficiency is. Nice. And then, um, guys, what's, so I, I, started, I started the whole the, the lectures by saying that the solar air thermal and the solar water thermal systems are identical, except they have two different fluids. What am I going to change? Like, what, what variable is most different between those two systems that, that I've, that's up there on the board right now? Actually, yeah, actually, there's two. The, the density. Is, is one, the, the water is 1,000 times more dense than the air, and C sub P um, scales roughly with that. I think, I think the uh, specific heat capacity of water is um, about 1,000 times greater than the specific heat of, because uh, there's, there's just more molecules to hold the energy. In, in, a, in a given volume of, uh, or even a given mass, there's just, there's just more there to hold it. So you want to look up those two numbers. You can, you can measure this, right? You can measure the velocity, and you, and you guys did it yesterday with, with, your, with the bag. Um, I know with the, with the solar thermal, you're able to measure the bubbles going through. You can just go and look up the density. That's, that's published. That's online. There's a little bit of change of density with respect to temperature. You know, air that is less dense, or air that is warmer is less dense, so that'll change. Um, and you should mention that in your reports and say, well, gosh, it's only 1% um, difference. And given our level of accuracy of measuring, we're not going to see that 1% difference. So you know, mention that. And then you can go and look up the specific, specific heat capacities of the fluids, too. And I think what you'll find is that um, war it, it, it is also a function of temperature, but not so much that it's going to affect your results a whole heck of a lot. And I, are, and I know you're measuring change in temperature. 
So you can, you can either look up or measure every single variable in this equation. There's no, there's no real mystery here. And, and all it's going to come down now, all it's going to come down to now is just taking several measurements, putting it into this equation, and then coming up with an efficiency. Now, in both systems, let's, let's, so is that, is that pretty clear? I mean, it was, there's not a whole, there's not a whole heck of a lot to it other than that. It was, it was just a matter of going through and finding it. And we've, we've talked about, you know, we've talked to these already. We know how to measure area. We can measure velocity. We can measure, we know what the densities are. So there's not, and, and from here it's just the same skills you, you had from 214. You put them into your spreadsheet. You, you change the numbers. You, and then go back to the same skills from 101 and 102. Plot them out and show them next to your, um, next to your data. Okay. So let's now get into a couple of the other little nitty gritties of the overall efficiencies. Uh, so let, let's see here. Let's let's draw the guy. Let's just draw it like this. So in both systems, um, you've got sort of your A in, let's call it, and then over here in the back you'll have. Uh, more or less your uh, A out. And we know that uh, P in equals um, A in phi uh, sine theta. And we know that uh, P out equals um, A out Q. And we know how to we know how to measure Q now. What what else is going on in terms of, of the efficiency of your system? What what can detract from the efficiencies? Thermal losses. Thermal losses. Yeah. Where? <laughs> kind of everywhere. Okay. <laughs> so like st stuff stuff like this. So I'll just I'll just say this is a this is a loss. This is going to be a um, a loss. What's another? another loss or another uh, reduction in efficiency? The reflection of the light. A little bit, right? So I, I could call, I'll just draw it like that as, bink, okay, there's a loss. Loss through convection. Wind going across the collector. Yeah, and I guess I've, I've kind of lumped convection and conduction in these two little loss areas. And there's a, there's a radiation loss. The other one, though, is the energy that you have to supply to run the system. That, that's a cost. And when I first started looking at uh, geothermal, I was always scratching my head, how could a geothermal system be 400% efficient? It's physically impossible, right? Well, as it turns out, in your geothermal system, you know, you, you plug it in and you might be running at, let's just say 100 watts, you know, whatever your pump is drawing. But the system might be giving you 400 watts of, 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 of uh, thermal energy. And so, um, I mean, that's how you can have more, more than 100% efficient. If we, if we weren't, uh, if, um, if we only had, you know, this is our power in and our pump as our power out, it would give us a different efficiency measure, but in this case we're, we're actually counting what's, you know, the, the good stuff that's coming out. So overall, your, your efficiency is going to equal uh, power, and so I'm just going to make it a little more complicated, over power out. Thank you. <laughs> power out, thank you. Um, over power in. And then what I'm missing is um, it's just this, minus power electric. And so I'd like to see in your report that type of equation. That's why you've got the, um, that's why you have the Kilowatt meter, thank you. So, so whatever, whatever, you're, and I think in I think in the case of the solar thermal water, it was what five watts. Yeah, 
five, five watts so, so put it in, but that's going to obviously make the numerator smaller and it's going to make the efficiency of your system less. Are you guys, have you guys been able to measure your power? No, throw, the Yeah, so just throw the kilowatt meter on there. And you'll, and you'll, so from there, you'll know what this number is and you'll know what your efficiency is. Because, you know, because big picture, the, these things, you know, long term, if you're installing a system in someone's house, they're going to be like, well, gosh, what, you know, why, why isn't this thing performing? Well, shoot, we had to, <laughs> here's, here's the, the tax, right? How do you get around that? Well, one way, and this is something we, we did a couple years ago, Tim and I, we put a little PV panel up here, and that PV uh, will run the fan, and now that's something we're getting as renewable energy. You know, in the case of this electric, you know, as, as we know, the Northwestern energy portfolio is such that it contains 75, 85% coal, so the majority of that power electric going in is, is non-renewable. And so what we're after here is, is, a, is an efficiency metric that's based on renewables. And so if you can, um, if, you, if you've got your PV up here, um, that's, it's not really contributing to your, to your losses in any way. You can sort of, it just, it neutralizes itself. As soon as, it, as soon as that energy comes in, it also goes out. Right, so, so one, a way to write that, so let's, let's just say uh, plug, and you, if you want to geek out on it, you can do this too, plug versus PV, you would write like this, um, P out minus your P, uh, I'll just say this, uh, PV over P in minus P, PV, because whatever is going out is also coming in, and they just essentially cancel each other out. You know, not exactly to, to zero, but you can see what it, whatever goes in your loss column is also in your gain column. Okay, so that's how to think about that. Um, I think that's enough theory. So I, I think you can measure things and put data uh, from there. And so, oh, the, the, I guess the next the next thing that I'd like you to do, I would, I would actually like you to uh, reference, and so ask me for this reference. So reference D um, Armstad 2015. Dustin did a little NRGY 295 with me and came up with a, little, a really nice document and some data that will will we'll show you with, that demonstrated uh, this sort of exponential rule. So if we've got time over here, if we have temperature over here, and we just take a a cold body, you know, your solar thermal technology, cold body inside the building in the morning, right? It's been sitting there all night. It's cold. Stick it out in the sunshine. So this, I'm just going to call this uh, T ambient, and don't let it do anything. It'll um, it'll it'll eventually reach some sort of steady state, and that's if and that's in the absence of this nice greenhouse effect that you've got going on. The really nice thing, the the key thing, the way we're sort of exploiting physics is you're taking you're you're taking that radiation, letting it go into the panel but it's not coming out. You know, it's not going back out as radiation. So what you're able to do here is sort of, you know, cheat a little bit, if you will, and, um, and go ab above, because it's, it's, it's 175, 180, 200 degrees inside your technologies. Thank goodness it's not that hot outside, but that's what you're able to do. But these, these two curves are basically, basically going to um, follow some exponential. And let's, let's go over that math here um, briefly. So when we, head, when we head out here, we're just going to call this sort of temperature at, um, I'll just call it T infinity, you know, like the, the temperature would, would reach ultimately 
if it just kind of stayed noon and that it hit the, at some point it's just not, it just can't get any hotter and that's T infinity. So what we're looking at is uh, temperature as a function of time, and that's what we just plotted, is going to equal, uh, I think I'm going to get this right, we'll see if I can get it right on the first time, T infinity 1 minus E to the T over tau. I, I, I think I think I got this right. I just I just kind of took a stab at it, but if if um, uh, let's go to infinity. I don't I don't think I got it quite right. I'm gonna I'm gonna pause right there. Make sure I got it right. What we what we want to get to though is a is a function where this rises rapidly and then slowly decays towards t infinity. So I'm gonna take a break. Then I'll fix that. Give me one quick sec.